So how do you distill it down to one, like who is this one girl? Like what does she look like? How will you know when she shows up? Um, she's not the typical that you'd see on Instagram. Very, okay. you know, conservative to a certain degree. Um, attractive, not a 10, maybe a 10 overall. Right. But physically attractive, something that I would be interested in. Always critiqued the physique, even in my own. Um, good family, great upbringing, uh, religious values, moral compass strong, um, educated, ambitious. Um, from a financial standpoint, I could not care less if she's just getting there in life or if she has nothing. That doesn't matter. Um, just a well-rounded, quote-unquote, wifey. Yeah. You can, you can, you can tell when a woman's ready to have a family and be a wife and be by a man's side for the rest of her life or if she's still in her, you know, little fun phase. But I want to talk about a couple sponsors here real quick. Trainingmass.com. You've heard me talk about them before. You train your breathing muscles. Most people don't think about this. It's a mask that you put on your face that you breathe through resistance, friction with a valve or something else. There's even filtered ones. But head over to trainingmask.com and check it out because you know all these people are going to the gym these days and carrying gym bags. I always wonder what's in there. If you don't have a training mask <laughs> in your gym bag, you need one. So use the code uh. Clark and save. Another sponsor we have is Vitos Lifestyle. A bunch of other stuff you could also put in your gym bag. Bands and like they have kettlebells. Not that you would put that in your gym bag, but accessories for the home. So you can basically build a home gym just by going to vitoslifestyle.com using the code Clark and just go there and check all that out. So I'm in the gym training probably a month ago with my training partners and they said, hey, do you mind if a buddy of ours comes in to work out? I'm like, absolutely not. Let's go. You know, everybody's welcome. They said, well, he's kind of dealing with some stuff right now. He basically was dead a couple months ago. He wrapped his car around a tree over on Del Dias Highway. And everyone that lives in this area knows that area. So I immediately thought, okay, what, what, who's walking in right now? And I looked out the window and I saw this guy walking in with two crutches at the time. And the fact that he was walking blew me away. And before I introduce my guest, I want to say this. Anyone who says that it's not possible to do something limits the ability of humans. And that's what my whole mission is, is to help you understand that if you decide you're going to do something, you can do it. You just have to want it bad enough. And my guest right now, Hadi Asi, is a man who four months ago? Five. Five months ago was pronounced dead, DOA, and yeah. told you could never walk again, basically exactly what they said <clears throat> that i may never walk again that i shouldn't be expected to have any movement in my lower extremities so when we met you had two crutches and then just in a matter of days you walked in and i was in the same place i was before when wally and zach and g said hey can our buddy come in i was looking out that same window and i saw you get out of your car with one crutch yeah and i thought look at this guy man he's already made an improvement so five months ago, you were told you may never walk again. Now you're walking into a gym to exercise. You had one crutch. Then you went down to, or you had two crutches. Then you went down to one. So then I started to challenge you because we hit it off right away. Bro. Yeah. I, I think you're freaking an amazing human. You inspired me. And that's what I want with this podcast today. I want you to like help people who don't believe, like people say bullshit stuff. Well, I can't lose weight. I can't do this. And you're like, bitch, I just started oh, walking yeah. again. There are no excuses. Right? None. So take <clears> us <throat> back to that faithful day of like, I, explain the whole thing. I, I want you to paint the picture and then we're going to show when you think it's time based upon your place in that story. Pull that a little bit closer to you. talking kind of because I want people to hear you. Right right okay. Yeah. So walk us through whatever you feel comfortable, you know. The night before I went out, I had a good time. I was healthy, fit at my probably best, 200 pounds, pretty lean. Um, <clears throat> that morning, <clears throat> woke up, had nothing to do. 
I uh, pulled the cover off my Lamborghini at the time and uh, counted my blessings. Thank God that I was lucky enough to be able to pull the cover off a Lambo and go for a drive in the morning because I had nothing to do, no plans. <clears throat> so I ran off to go grab coffee and on my way to coffee, five minutes, seven minutes out from my house, disaster strikes. I know nothing of the scenario until I wake up in the hospital. I lost control. Um, car was going about 100 miles an hour on a straight stretch of Del Dios Highway. Spun out from underneath me. Uh, tires were dated. I didn't pay attention. Um, and that's the alleged culprit was the tires or a mechanical failure. Um, wake up in the hospital. They ask me if I know where I am. I have a clear recollection that I was in an accident, but I don't remember the actual incident. So, um, <clears throat> incident, uh, point of impact, I was knocked unconscious. Um, so from that point forward, I just, I, I'm drugged up, go into emergency surgery. I'm bleeding out. I have three broken ribs. I have a collapsed lung. My hip, my pelvic completely separated from one side, top and bottom broke. Um, seven vertebrae busted, one of them completely broken. Uh, and it was leaning into my spinal cord, which caused edema in my spinal cord, swelling. And if you have swelling in your spinal cord, it attacks, it'll, it can, can ruin all your nerves. So they had to have surgery on me and I was bleeding out profusely. So I had four liters of blood loss at the moment. They had to pump blood back into me enough to where I could go into surgery. And from there, they put me in induced coma, coming out of surgery for another 24 hours to see if I would be okay to take off, to, to, to pull back out of the coma. And I woke up and uh, that's where my nightmare began. So, yeah. So before we get into that part of the nightmare, you had mentioned to me in the gym when you were telling me the story there that, so we always hear this, you know, someone wrapped their car around a tree or a pole or whatever, you literally, Wrapped a car. Now this car is worth what? Half a million bucks or something? I mean, yeah, four fifty, five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand dollar car. And you explained <clears> to me like I've been driving exotics my whole life. It's not like I didn't know what I was doing because that's what people are going to think automatically. No, oh, yeah, right. Like, oh, you shouldn't be driving a car like that. You're going too fast. You don't know what you're doing, but you clearly did because, as stated, you've been driving these cars forever. Uh, I've gone to racing school. I've gone to rallies i've done car rallies for the last 10 years of my life um i set up drives with my friends to go up Palomar mountain to go up uh, through the canyons of los angeles um random drives since i was 24 23 yeah I mean, and all exotic cars if, if dale earnhardt <clears throat> jr runs in, or dale earnhardt runs into a wall and dies yeah you just, know it's any minuscule mistake at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour can be catastrophic and we have no control over them we think we do and no matter how good of a driver you are if your tires are dated and the, the rubber is is hard you have no control over that because if they're not hot enough they're not going to stick so anything can make them spin out um, if you have a mechanical failure again you have no control over this it's in god's hands it's not in ours um, and yeah that day unfortunately was the first time i had had a wreck i never wrecked an exotic in my life prior. So you're driving, it suddenly goes out of control. You're aware of the fact, oh shit, something's about to go down. Yeah, I had the oh shit moment and I was counter steering to try to correct it because that's what you do instantly. Counter steer had no impact on it, none whatsoever. Um, so last second, I decide to flip it the other way in the direction it's going in prayer that the car would spin and nail the curb and maybe just roll over a few times down, down the hill. Um, and that wasn't the case. I knocked out and the car kept going on its trajectory. So you like, we have video footage after the fact. Now, when I say like <laughs> the, the front end literally touched the back end when you wrapped around the pole and yeah. shot you out and you flew, how far did you say? Um, they said they found me 10 feet away from the car. So I don't know if I was shot out. If I got out with adrenaline, I, there's no recollection. And there's no, um, there's no witness to it. Right. Or at least nobody had spoken up yet. So we don't know. So you want to take a look <clears throat> at the video right now here? You can go ahead and roll that for us, Jim. 
So if you're watching or listening on a podcast, we're seeing a tow truck backing up with a $500,000 car doors up, literally front separated from the back. How a human got out of that. Play it one more time, Jim, just so, yeah, kind of go through that. How a human walked out of it, well, or didn't walk out of it, but is sitting in front of me today alive is an absolute miracle, in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, look at that right there. The back end is not even on the tow truck. Yeah, <clears throat> it's definitely a miracle. So there was another video that I saw where the tow truck was pulling it out and the front separated from the back. Like it was just hanging on by a thread. I have it. I'll find it and I'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> wow. I mean, okay. You'd also told me a couple other things. Now, anything that I ask you that you don't feel comfortable sharing, don't just tell me, hey, I, I don't want to talk about that. And I'm totally fine with it. But you, you had some possessions on you, right? So now you, you crashed this car. People obviously hear it. They start coming out. You said a lot of people showed up. You're obviously not aware of what's going on. You'd mentioned something about a watch. Did you? Yeah, I was wearing uh, a valuable watch and uh, somebody stole it off my wrist. Like walked up to you while you're laying there almost dying. It's the only way it could come off. It had like a, I think it's a triple clasp on that model. And you can't, there's no way it would fly off. And if the airbag were to have hit my arm or hit it, it would have pushed it back into my, into my forearm. Right. If the arm was the other way around, then yeah, I would say, okay, maybe if the arm was like this, maybe the airbag could have shot it off, but you're holding the steering wheel like that. Well, even the watch you're wearing now is just a typical mechanism that is a This little... is a standard. The other one kind of has like a three-fold clip right. where you can unclasp it and it'll open up. Yeah. But they have to come off this way. They won't come off. Right. Well, what I'm saying is that one wouldn't come off. So this one, I Should understand never. those three full clips, how they work. And, yeah. Yeah. Should never. And it was a solid gold watch. So <laughs> that, that just blows my mind how a human could walk up to another human in their most desperate moment in life and see something of value, more valuable than a human and decide to take it and leave the scene or pretend like it wasn't in their pocket while they were acting as if they were a good human yeah i was i was beyond angry with the situation or the scenario once i realized what had happened but moving forward closer to this point i kind of you know whoever took it must have needed it more than i did my insurance paid me out in the car i'm okay in life it doesn't really impact me right the fact that it's missing or gone um it had sentimental value but the, the actual monetary value meant nothing to me yeah. so I, I hope they wear it in good health or that they sell it and do something right with the money for themselves. They, they clearly needed it. So that's, that's <laughs> that where blows I'm at. my mind, man. It's kind of even hard to move past that, but let's move past that because it obviously hurts you. And I, I want the outcome of this podcast is for anyone watching to be encouraged by what is possible with determination and desire and the fact that you could be told something and do something different. Because a lot of people say, well, you'll never be able to lose this weight or you'll never be able to save your marriage or you'll never be able to raise your testosterone naturally. All the stuff I talk about, which all pales in comparison to this conversation. But I want the story of Hadi Asi to encourage people to never stop trying. Because if you would have laid in that hospital bed saying, okay, I'm never going to walk. You wouldn't have he walked wouldn't in walk. It's all it's all in your hands, you know. You have to keep striving towards your goals. And um if we don't make the constant effort to improve ourselves or better ourselves, nothing no, nobody's gonna do it for us, right? In any aspect of life, really. Right. I, so, and you, we didn't start from the beginning. I was bedridden for forty five days. I was in a wheelchair for two months, month and a half. I was on a walker for a month and a half. And slowly my nerves are starting to mend themselves. That's what I was going to do. I was going to go, okay, let's, I, I wanted to kind of walk through this process so people can paint the picture in their mind of what's next. So now they pick you up off the ground. They throw you in the back of the ambulance. You're on Del Dios Highway in Escondido, California, a beautiful road that everyone takes. This tragedy hits. Do you remember being in the back of the ambulance? Not at all. 
So you woke up, you, you said that, I'm sorry, you woke up in the hospital. Where'd they take you, Palomar or? Palomar, because it's the nearest hospital. Right. So when you woke up in there, what did you see around you? Like what was? Just, I, was on a, I was on a bed and um, I had a doctor asking me if I had a point of contact, emergency contact. They woke me up just to get an emergency contact so somebody would know where and what had happened. Right. And fortunately for me, my parents flew in the night before at 4 or 5 p.m. from into LAX from Lebanon. Oh, wow. So they weren't what even here. So, yeah, it's the whole series of events and everything that led to it alongside everything that's come since is all very strange. <laughs> it's almost like everything has been meant to happen throughout this scenario. So from having Wally and the guys and you, you know, invite me to come train every day. Um, I have other friends that invite me to train all the time. I have friends that, you know, there's always been, there's this constant love, pour of like love that's come into my life. And I've always had it, but it, but everyone has kind of stood up in this scenario and, and been by my side and kind of kept me out of depression. And it's normal. We're human, right? So yeah. um, very fortunate and blessed. Yeah, because he showed me his photos. He's like, dude, look what I looked like before the accident. And he was jacked. He would have been a guy or he is the guy who would walk into a gym now more than ever, right? What you're doing now is more impressive than building muscle because any dickhead can go in the gym and, and get buff, right? Yeah. But not any man can do what you did. Like when I saw you walking in with those crutches, I'm like, damn, this dude's a badass. And when I saw you walk in with one, now getting to know you, like the other day I challenged him, like, can you squat? He's like, yeah, I think I, think I can squat. I'm like, let's go. And I just barely touched my fingers. He squatted all the way down, full squat, came back up. I'm like, yeah, let's go. And, and that's the value of that relationship that you just referred to. So anyway, you're in the hospital. They call. Now your parents first ones to show up and walk in the room. My dad. Um, and he couldn't make it to the hospital. So he called a cousin to meet him to drive him because he was shaking. He didn't know what was going on. It's your only son, you know. Um, dad comes. He sees me. Watches me stop breathing twice in the ER. Um, my dad's 80 years old. Not easy on him. Uh, he hides it from my mom for 24 hours, and then he has to break. Oh, damn. Yeah. So he finally lets her know. And, uh, yeah, it was a very difficult time for them. I can't imagine what they went through. They already lost one son. And so, Ugh. yeah. So to break the emotional thing, buddy, the podcast support dog just farted. I, I smelled it. I didn't know <laughs> if it was. <laughs> I smelled that for sure. Yeah, it's it's tough, man. Buddy, he, you know, he, he is the sp podcast support dog for a reason because he was like, this is getting a little bit too deep. You guys are about to cry. I'm just going to bust my ass right now. Kind of interrupt the flow a little bit to, so it you, you don't lose control here. So, yeah, we won't get into that whole conversation. That has to, yeah, but. So you're there, and the next thing after the initial deal was, okay, we're taking you into surgery. We're going to do X, Y, and Z on you. Like, what is the conversation that happens with you prior to? Oh, they, um, so they'd pumped enough blood into me to give me a point where I could go into an emergency surgery. And at this point, and they've assessed the damage that was done to know that I needed surgery. Um, and, um, they run a bunch of tests on me to see what I can feel, what I can't feel. And they tell me that I have to have this procedure. Otherwise I will be paralyzed from the waist down. And that if I do this now, there could be hope moving forward because at this point there is no hope because I can't they give feel you anything. any kind of ratio. Like there's a 50, 50 chance. Oh, work, they, they said you will most likely will not walk out of here. Even with this procedure? Even with the procedure. Oh, damn. Okay. Um, but over the course of time, your, ner your nerves may reconnect. You, you might start feeling something. We, we don't know. But they, they also, they say certain things to keep from being sued, maybe, you know? I yeah. don't know. They have to give you worst-case scenarios. They can't give you best-case scenarios because then if you don't have, don't have a best case, you're going to come back and say, well, you told me, you know? Oh. That's a shame that we have to kind of, I use this all the time, default to a lower energy comment than one. It's like, hey, we're going to do our best here and there's a really good chance that we could get you to a place to, to give you some hope instead of, 
Yeah, most likely, whether we do this or not, you're probably not going to walk out of here. It gave me no hope. And even when I talked to my neurosurgeon on multiple occasions, he would kind of throw his hands up and tell me, just take it day by day. If in two years you don't have any more than what you have now, then you know you're stuck with what you have, but you have up to two years to kind of rebuild. So who gave you the hope in those moments? Like, where did you get that Nobody. hope from? It's just me internally. I, um, Yeah, there's no hope there. So how did you find it? Did you have a faith-based upbringing or what, what is it that, where did you go to? I had a faith-based upbringing. Yeah. My, uh, my family's Muslim. Um, I think all religions are one. Um, if you have a faith-based upbringing, you kind of leave it in the hands of God and do your part. You can't just leave it in his hands. You got to do your part as well. Right. So my part was just to try to remain mentally strong, um, avoid those downward spikes in my emotions which is normal to have when you're bedridden you, you know i went from being mr bachelor you know yeah. cool cars not a not a not a bad looking guy i guess you know um lots of friends lots of girls around all the time i had everything and then i went from being at that point in my life to ground none of it mattered anymore I was going to ask you what the lesson is in what you went through. And I think you just said it, that none of that stuff really matters. You know, in all honesty, Clark, I never, um, I never cared for these things. So for me, the cars that I own, I have, so I, I got into e-com. I, I granted grocery stores and restaurants for 10 years and I got into e-com. I, my income over the years as you know, if you work hard every passing year, things will compound. And you get to a certain point at some point where you can do whatever it is that you please, you know, because you have the means to at that point. Um, so when I had the means, I went and I leased a Ferrari in like 2014, brand new from the dealership. Um, payment was like 2,500 bucks a month. I didn't care. Put 40 grand down. Big deal. Um, drove it for two years. I think I lost 50 grand on that car in two years. And then I, I got rid of it. Bought something else. Um, I think I bought a Rolls Royce. And then um, I cashed that one out because I didn't want to take a loss. But I made sure to buy it right. I drove it for like two or three years. I sold it. I made a profit. I kept flipping cars. And it became more of like a, a hobby business to me that was a profitable income stream to where I was able to flip exotic cars, drive them for free basically, or get paid to drive them. Um, so I have a passion for cars, but I don't care to own anything that's going to depreciate. I look for cars that appreciate in value um, or cars that I can buy right and get out of at a certain point before they start to dip. Um, but uh, yeah. So you, you never really like bought into that whole materialistic thing, even though you had this stuff, it was just a means to an end for you. Basically it was an income thing. So the lesson still like, what do you think you walked away from using that as a, Kind of a pun in a way. I think the lesson was to slow down in life. Um, literally and figuratively. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> and it was um, maybe to, to build a family of my own, stop doing this whole bachelor life that I had. It wasn't uh, the best thing for me. It leaves you kind of empty at the end of the day. You have fun. You get to go out with hot girls. You get to sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. You, you get invited to all the parties you want to go to, but it's it's there's no substance to it, and there's no end game. There will always be another party. There's always a new hot chick coming into town. There's always a new hot girl that wants to go out with you. There's always a, a plethora of them that want to sleep with you and, and do all of it, but, but none of it um, gives you the satisfaction of family. So none of it's fulfilling. We're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, I'm going to ask Hadi a question about what he had just talked about right there, so we'll be right back in a second. When was the last time you had blood work done? Now, I'm specifically talking to men, because I know most women are going to take care of their health, but men, for some reason, don't want to go to the doctor, and the guys that I talk to in my coaching program typically haven't had their blood work done in a while. Let me tell you something. It's so important to understand what's going on in your blood. That's the only thing that can tell you where you're lacking in nutrients, what might be happening in your life that will never be figured out otherwise. So this is the reason I've created a relationship with Merrick Health. Now, what we're going to do when you click on the link in the show notes is 
get you set up to have your blood work done. It's as simple as filling out a form and then going off to a, a lab core or one of the places that we would send you in your town, local to you, takes you a few minutes. Listen, schedule it into your life because it's that important. I have a discount for code for you. It's Clark. Just put that into the thing. You're going to save some money, and you're going to go get your blood work done. We're going to find out what's going on in your life, and hopefully there's nothing to be concerned about, but you won't know until you get it done. So fill out the form, book it, and make it happen. So the question I have then, you had the life that everybody wanted, right? You, the cars, the money, the girls, the parties, the fun, the bachelor existence. You're how old now? 41. 41. So do you feel like this experience in a, in a grand scheme, because you had mentioned it earlier, you feel like everything had lined up. Now in hindsight, you look back. And like your parents showed up from Lebanon the night before. And then, you know, all of these things that happened, even the watch being stolen for some weird reason. Do you think that the big plan in all of this was to get you to like stop that lifestyle in a way? Like, were you not capable of stopping that lifestyle on your own unless there was an intervention like this? I was capable, but it's like a drug. <laughs> you you kind of get caught up in a certain lifestyle. And I think it needed to go down this way for, to pull me out of it. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's... It's taught me more appreciation for my friends, for, for everything around me from A to Z in life. Um, the simple things always gave me the greatest pleasure. Yeah. I got the most fulfillment out of doing things that cost me nothing in life. Um, I've never been materialistic. I don't care for you could take me to Rodale Drive and I don't not, like zero zero part of me has any inclination to walk in any of those stores and buy anything I don't I don't could not care less um, and I think maybe that comes with being fulfilled in life and knowing that you have the ability to do so and that's maybe why I don't want to I've always kind of been like the the sheep in a herd of cows you know like, <laughs> yeah. I'm the guy that goes in the opposite direction of the of the masses I can't stand to do what everyone else is doing yeah well you mentioned the simple things in life right so walking how yeah. many how many times have you heard someone say i don't want to walk there it's too far out oh, do we got to mm-hmm. walk I, yeah, complaining about walking yeah now you're learning how to walk again yeah maintaining your balance what would your message be to someone who just kind of says that out of habit? That's their default thing. Like, oh, bro, I don't want to walk there. I can't walk that far. Walk, you know, like act like walking is some kind of fucking curse <laughs> where you're realizing, damn, bro, <laughs> I couldn't walk for how long? You said you were four months. You went through this process. Break that process down again and then answer and then talk to the people about the the blessing of being able to walk. So let, let's start with the first bit. Bedridden then to a wheelchair for well over a month and while i was in the wheelchair by the way for the first month i couldn't shower so i was having like uh, bird baths that they'd give me with towels and the first day that they were able to get me to scoot off my wheelchair onto the bench in a shower i started crying because it was the first time i'd felt water run down on my and these are the things again that we don't appreciate because they're, they're the norm that we live in but the blessing that that it is to have to be able to turn the water on, have running water come down on your head, over your head, and, and lather yourself up with soap is, is a blessing in itself that we don't understand. But until you lose it, when somebody strips you of it, you'll get it, you'll grasp it. And I never would have, you know? Like it was my norm. Walking was my norm. Getting up and, you know, just going about my day was a norm. And all of it was taken away from me. Um, but yeah, so wheelchair for well over a month, walker chair, walker for well over a month. Walking sticks have been about two months now. Um, I'm down to one, as you've seen. And hopefully in another month or so, I can you know, be without any of them, without any assistance. But I think it's going to take longer than that. I don't. I hope not. No. It, the, I have the will, so hopefully not. In the progress I've seen you make, and I, I'm a very observant person. I, I look with probably a different set of eyes than a lot of people do because I understand the, the like how strong human will is and the ability for your body to recover and the progress I've seen in the short period of time, I I fully expect your expectation will be cut in half 
And that's the energy that I want to put out for you and believe that with you because I don't want to be like a doctor telling you what ain't going to happen. Oh, of course. You know what I mean? I want to be that friend who is the one who maybe expects more from you than less to have you come skipping in the gym. You know, and I'm seeing that in my like, here comes Javi skipping into the gym. Look I can't at this wait guy. For that, man. Yeah. Can't wait for that day to come. So yeah. God willing it does and yeah. Hopefully next six months or sooner. Yeah, absolutely. So with respect to walking, I asked you to to like talk to people and just kind of shake them up a little bit, right? Like, hey, come on, like really put this in perspective. You know? Uh, (laughs) I'm not the greatest at these things, but I mean, given that you're given the ability to do whatever it is that you can do in your life, you should take advantage of it. You're given limbs that function. You're given a mind that functions. You're given an entire body that does what it's supposed to do. You should take advantage of, of, of the situation that you're given in life. Um, there's, there's really nothing that's not within reach. If you have a goal in mind, and you go after it, you will achieve it. You can look at Clark's physique, my physique before the wreck, um, my success in life and business. Uh, it all comes from a will, a fire within. And if you have it, you can achieve. No, no motivational speaker is going to teach you anything. You, you, going to these powwows doesn't help. It's within you. You have to decide that you want to do something. You don't need to listen to anybody or hear anybody tell you that you can do it. Um, it's... It's a little spark, something we have inside of us, every entrepreneur. And you're either an entrepreneur or you're not. And if you think you are, go for it. Go for the gold. Yeah, dude, that was great. I, I, I certainly couldn't have said it better myself because I've not been in your position. You're the only one in this room who has the authority, just like me as a coach, right? That's why men over 50 come to me because I'm the guy that has done that. And, and, and you're the person that's come back from being told – you may never walk again. Yeah. So what, so all of that process, now we're here. So where do we go from here? Like what's next for you? How do, how do you take all of what happened to you? And let me back up a second. Have you ever gotten so drunk and you woke up the next day and you're puking and you feel like shit and you say, I'll never do that oh, again. for sure. But you do it again. Yeah, of course. Because the pain wore off. Yeah. <clears throat> do you ever feel like, with respect to what you said about maybe this happened to me because I was meant to have a family? Because I want to talk about that. I was meant to stop this bachelor lifestyle. So is do you see any way that this could be like that proverbial hangover where the impact of what happened to you wears off and that hot chick rolls up that came into town and you're living the hottie of before BA, before accident. I don't think that's a possibility. Okay. It is, it isn't a definite. No. Um, I've had my fun. I've gotten it out of my system. I actually want to have kids. My dad's 80 years old. I want him to see my kids. Um, my mom's getting up there. And then for me, you know, I just want to have them running around the house, have a wife, somebody by my side that you can wake up to and trust with, you know, your life. I'm not, I didn't, I didn't in business as I've progressed in life, nothing have done. I didn't make the money to start blowing it. If that was the case, you'd see me pulling up in Bugattis. Um, I built my little nut to provide for my family so that I don't have to work as much as my dad did growing up so I could have time to spend with the family at home. So I've always had it in mind. I just kind of got distracted with everything that was getting thrown at me. Yeah. Well, it's easy to get distracted by hot women and money and cars and parties. Yeah. What man, like what man is not going to get distracted by all of that? And there's a saying that a man is only as good as he's only as faithful as his options. Now I don't, I don't, that's not true for me because there are options available and I choose not to exercise those. That's a whole different story, but you had options available to you. And, and you said, I oh, kind of a looking guy. No, you're, I saw your photo. You're handsome now. Thank you. And, and you were handsome. Then you had the body, right? Because that, that is part of what people want. So it was so freaking simple, right? It's it so was, simple. it was like shooting fish in a barrel, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> 
uh, it's easy to get caught up in that. And I did. Yeah. But I never, you know, if I had a girlfriend, I was loyal. Okay. I was always loyal to my girlfriends. But whenever I'd be in that single phase or she was like, I don't want to do this. I'm like, sayonara. Take off and do my thing, you know? And it was easy. I had a thousand girls on Instagram that would always message or like or heart or something. And if it wasn't them, I could download Hinge or Bumble or one of these apps and you get two, three hundred girls in a couple of days and they're all ready to go to dinner, you know? Yeah. Dinner usually leads to more the same night. So how do you take all of that, what you've learned and distill it down to a person who you want to be with for the rest of your life, knowing those options would always be available. And you're a faithful guy, so that's that's good because that would be hard to kind of tame the unfaithful person, right? So at least you have that going for you. And that comes from your upbringing. That comes yeah. from your parents. That comes from having integrity and character because there's nothing wrong with running around and being a bachelor. That's no. what we all do. Yeah, we're men. We're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, Everyone we're... single is supposed to have a good time and enjoy it. You know? Yeah. So how do you distill it down to one? <laughs> like, who is this one girl? Like, what does she look like? How will you know when she shows up? Um, she's not the typical that you'd see on Instagram. Very, okay. you know, conservative to a certain degree. Um, attractive. Not a 10. Maybe a 10 overall. Right. But physically... Attractive, something that I would be interested in. And I've always critiqued the physique, even in my own. Yeah. Um, good family, great upbringing, uh, religious values, moral compass strong, um, educated, ambitious. Um, from a financial standpoint, I could not care less if she's just getting there in life or if she has nothing, that doesn't matter. Um, just a well-rounded, quote-unquote, wifey. Yeah. You can you can you can tell when a woman's ready to have a family and be a wife and be by a man's side for the rest of her life or if she's still in her, you know, little fun phase. Yeah. I think I found somebody but oh, okay. Who knows, you know? All right. You know, and I'm asking you that for a reason, right? We're not just like doing some uh, dating show interview. This is like, literally, I'm trying to walk you through a process of really letting this stuff settle in your mind because all of this is still fresh, man. You're talking five months ago. Basically, you were dead. You were told you couldn't walk again. So we're still in the infancy stages of this transitional moment in your life. you know. And as someone who's come into your life as a friend and someone who is married, and has been married for 34 years and had a similar background to yours, I understand what it looks like moving into stopping all of that. Yeah. Like it's just like hitting that damn telephone pole. You're moving 100 miles an hour, passing by a lot of people because you're in a vehicle that is more capable than a lot of these guys you're passing by. 100%. And then boom, all of a sudden it stops. You fly out, the watch goes, like there's – an analogy here of okay now you got this one girl it it it's different it's it's different you know and the lesson that you learn will be of value to you in that moment you know of transition if you will 100 percent. yeah it has been so i'm i'm uh i wish it never happened oh, of course but at the same time i've learned so much through this process about myself um even about people around me. Yeah. You know, I had I have I have thousands of acquaintances. There's no exaggeration in the number. And um there were some that I believed were friends. And you know, when you're in the hospital, you're bedridden, you're coming out of a coma, um, and a a life threatening situation, and certain people don't show up, you put them in a different category. I don't hate them. I have nothing against these people. And I'll still say hi and talk to them if they call or whatever, but they're not who I thought they were in my life, you know? I thought they were family. I thought they were brothers, but clearly yeah. they're not. Well, I talked about this earlier in a segment I was doing. People are in your life for a season, a reason, or a lifetime. 100%. And you found out the ones who were in there for a season and not a lifetime. And there may have been people for reasons, business dealings, whatever, yeah. party friends or whatever, and, and they're done. But I love when we really find out who is there to back us up. I had a guest, maybe you've met him in the gym before, uh, Cisco from the gym. He spent 17 years in prison. And oh, I, yeah. I sat here and asked him the same thing. He's like, dude. 
See the guy with the grill? No, he doesn't have a grill. No? He's a uh, little bit shorter than me. I'll have to introduce you to him. He's a fantastic human. We met in the gym there. But he said, man, Clark, listen, my homies, my homies on, from the street, you know, didn't show up when I was locked down. I found out who. And, and that's a hard time, right? So when we go through these different places in life, the people who are meant to be in our life for a lifetime will show up for you. Because there's nothing in it for them at that moment, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not they're not going there to, to have a good time. They're not going to a restaurant. There's no cute girls running around. There's no like traditional benefit that they benefited from in the past right. coming into a hospital. So let's talk about community for a while because that's one of my five lifestyle principles. You just kind of referenced it a minute ago with being in the gym and having your buddies show up and I'm I'm proud and happy to be a part of that community now. It's it's still early on, but I don't know if you feel the same way I did about the a connection no, that of course. you know is kind of like instant right there. And <clears throat> it's so vital, man. It's so vital to get people who don't treat you any kind of way. You know what I mean? Because, oh, you know, he's on crutches or he had an accident. So not, now there's this like different, like we don't do that in the gym. It's just shit talking, guys having fun. Nothing is different. We're going to push you. We're going to challenge you and we're going to cause you to grow. You know, how important that is for you? Is that for you right now in this oh, process? It's crucial. It's of the utmost importance. You know, I can make to the gym on my own, but having the community is definitely a plus. It, it's like, uh, it's like taking testosterone <laughs> you know you have that extra push yeah. that you need you know right. so i've got that extra push from my community yeah. you're a part of it so and i appreciate you for it yeah well I, I feel the same way man it's it's so fun to have people in your life who really bring the best out in you and i think you bring the best out in people when you don't try you're just being you and having a connection and it's just a natural, I talk about proximity a lot and I use, oh, what's his name? The quarterback, what the hell's the name? The best quarterback in the world. Why am I? Tom Brady. Oh yeah. <laughs> Tom Brady as an example. Tom Brady makes people better athletes who may have been not so good when they weren't around him just by being in the proximity of him. Like the energy that surrounds Tom Brady makes his receivers run routes better. So they end up where they should be. And he throws the ball to that spot. They meet and it happens. And, and that's what being around people like Wally and Zach and G and me now do for you and you do for me. Because that day you walked into the gym, I'm like, damn, look at this dude. And I see you coming up the ramp and I'm like, wow, I'm a pussy. <laughs> it's definitely I'm, not a pussy but well you know what i mean <clears throat> i get it yeah you get it because people make a big deal of be, of, about me because oh i got abs or whatever and, and and i get it because it's the world that we live in but like it, it's a win-win situation we both get value from being around each other and i wish people understood that more like that's what churches are for that's what aa and na oh. and these organizations and energy is contagious as humans we all want to belong or be a part of something that's why churches are so successful that's why religious groups have such large followings they're, they're communities and they can it's easy to pull someone in um into any community yeah we're gonna take a quick break we'll be right back and we'll end this thing up with some more more great information one of the number one things that I do to stay in shape year round is have my meals prepped all the time. And it's not my wife prepping them. It's not me prepping them. It's Icon Meals doing the prepping for me. They're professionals. This is what they do for a job. And let me tell you, with the discount code Clark and the free shipping that you'll get, you probably can't make meals for the same amount of money that you will invest getting meals from Icon Meals. So here's what I want you to do. If you're interested on any level on being prepared all the time and having nutrition dialed in, head over to iconmeals.com right now, use the promo code Clark and save and see how it improves your life like it's improved mine and so many others. So head on over to iconmeals.com right now. Okay, I know I kind of asked this a little bit earlier, but I think it's important to maybe talk about again because... 
none of us are going to avoid some sort of chaos in our lives, something that causes us to get off track. And hopefully most of us will never experience something as devastating as what you went through. But because you went through that devastating thing, I think all of us can walk away with tools that would help us, whether it's a financial disaster or a marital disaster or something like that. Like, what did you really hold on to? Because you said there wasn't anyone walking in giving you that encouragement. I mean, like, how do you dig in and, and find the hope? Was it minute by minute sometime or second by second? How did you, how did you string the series of thoughts together to get you to here today? Um, <clears throat> I've always had a strong mind. So I, can, I think for everyone, it's different. For me, I've always had a strong mind. So I kept pushing myself and praying that something would change, you know? That, that's worth stopping on right there in, in kind of unpacking that a little bit. A strong mind, I talk about mindset all the time, right? So praying, you coupled the strong mind with prayer. So you weren't relying on yourself only. You were no, relying on God. So the combination of those two things <clears throat> is a pretty powerful force. Yeah, I believe so. So belief and faith, faith, right? So let's, let's kind of dive into that a little bit more. What did it look like in, in a horrible moment? I mean, it's a struggle, man. You go through ups and downs. You know, one moment you feel like you're seeing an ounce of progress. And the next moment you're not. And... <clears throat> You get uh, pushed down into this downward spiral of depression and lift yourself back out of it and keep pushing. And then, you know, it can, it, it's a roller coaster. It would happen, you know, I don't know. In the beginning, I would probably break down mentally at least once or twice a day. And it was probably only once or twice a day because I had a plethora of people coming in. I think I had 40 to 60 visitors a day in the ER, in the ICU. Wow. The, the, yeah, the, the, the valet guy thought I was a celebrity. <laughs> He's like, well, I you were saying people didn't show up. <laughs> but if people didn't show up and you were still getting 40 to 60 people a day. I had family, you friends. Had... I, had a, I have a very wide network of people. Yeah. So did you ever lay there and think, why me? Oh, for sure. Every day. And I still, you know, I, I, I questioned it. I still question it. I'd, I'd be lying if I said I didn't still question that. Because I know there are plenty of terrible people that may have been more suited for something of that catastrophic nature to happen to them. But I don't wish it on anyone else. Um, I just tried to piece the puzzle together and kind of understand or comprehend why me, why not someone else, right? So or in why me moments, in general? In the mindset, with like probably more on the prayer side, you're asking God, literally, why me, dude? Yeah, like, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Did you ever get any sort of answer like in in your spirit in your gut or somebody or even like the, the tv came on and somebody said something you're like oh wow i kind of you know in, in, in our it's so in, in islam a part of the religion and fulfilling your like duties in religion is to to marry and have a family and so um i've had myself i came to that conclusion and i've had others tell me the same um so i, I firmly believe that's Okay, so you'd mentioned your dad's 80. Your mom's how old? My mom is 12 or 13 years younger than him, so she's okay. 67. So her chances of seeing you have kids are greater than his. Yeah. So is that something during your bachelor days and you just out there banging and slanging and doing what you were doing, did you feel any kind of guilt because you knew that your religion and your upbringing and your life, your dad... Because the, the same sex parent has the most influence on a child. So I'm assuming that your dad and you have this bond that you're like, man, I want to give my dad a kid someday, but I'm having too much damn fun and I'm never going to make it happen for him. You know, it's, I was in Greece um, last summer. I did like a Euro trip and I ended up in Greece at the end of it or towards the end of it. And I had like a wake up call. <laughs> So I had like an on-off relationship and um, had this epiphany, ep epiphany, and I decided I'm going to come home and marry my girlfriend. And so I bought a ring. I went through all the hoops and loops, told family, um, came back, and it just it never got to the point where I could actually propose. So I had a ring. So I was ready mentally, and that kind of 
you know, I f- it fell apart. I drifted away from it. And then I went nuts. I started partying again. So why couldn't you ask her? Was she not the right person or you just were having cold feet ish? No, I was ready. Um, I think she was having cold feet. Uh, everyone's different, right? Yeah. I don't think she was ready mentally to dive into family and kids and doing her duty as a woman. So I got to know, I, I, how much did you spend on the ring? Uh, <laughs> that's top secret information, really? but it's not cheap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, based upon everything we've talked about so far. It's a beautiful ring. Yeah. Do you uh, still have it? I have it. I'll have it melted. I'll use the stones um, or maybe even swap them, get something bigger. I don't know. Uh, why you just don't feel right because you intended this ring for somebody else it was intended for her so I feel like it's bad juju on it yeah you gotta give the next the wifey right a ring that's got nothing attached to it well you know that whole thought is interesting right that you kind of on a spiritual and a foundational level of who you are you feel like it's your duty especially being the only son now right yeah that you carry on the aussie name oh of course yeah, yeah. No, it, it will happen hands yeah. down and um yeah yeah i think had my ex been more in line with what i was looking for or ready because i had talks about marriage with her i would have proposed and i would have married her i don't, I don't know if she would have been the right fit so um I forgot what's going with that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's totally fine. I do it all the time. I'm like, man, I had a great thought that I wanted to share. I'm taking like, this nerve medication called gabapentin. My wife is on gabapentin. And it's causing extreme brain fog. Okay. So I have like moments where I kind of. Okay. So you just validated something for me because as a married man over 34 years, my wife is on gabapentin right now and she will say stupid stuff. And she will, and she's not a stupid person. Sure. And then she'll say, it's the medication. And I'm like, come on, bro. Like you're, you're come making on. something up. It can so, legitimately cause serious brain fog. Yeah. Because she, and I'm like, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get how you don't remember what we just said or. It happens to me quite often. Yeah. Okay. So Anita, if you watch this episode, you're off the hook. I apologize. I was wrong. It is the medication just been verified by my buddy Hottie here. I, so they gave you the gabapentin for where you having seizures or. Um, so I have, uh, I have a disruption in my nerves that goes down to my lower extremities. Um, and I have a shooting pain in my leg, in my calf and my foot, probably 20, 30 times a day. It's supposed to stop it. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know how effective it is. Um, I still feel the pain, but I don't know what I would feel if I didn't take it. So I just don't, I kind of don't want to weed off it yet. It's, it's funny that we're talking about this because she, Anita just came to me right before I came here. She just came from her neurologist and they were supposed to take her down. You got to go? No, no, oh, no. no. Okay. It's okay. They were supposed to take her down from, I think she's on either three a day or whatever. And, and they, she was sad. Because they're like, oh, they're going to keep me on the same amount. And, no, and she, I, can, she can try on her own. So you you can take, I think it's up to 3,200 3, 3, milligrams a day. I was taking one three times a day. Yeah. It didn't do anything for me. All right. So I went to two three times a day, and then I went to three three times a day. And I've been on three three times a day for like four months now. Okay. She's on one three times a oh, day. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah. I, I believe, if, if I'm correct, but... Yeah, she wants off of it so bad because of the the brain fog and and you know it probably feels horrible like just the statement. I mean, she says stupid things like "Don't give me," like legitimately it causes her to like be kind of out of context sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's normal. Yeah. Okay. It is normal. Yeah. Like I even catch myself pass exits and like weird right. things that I never did before. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we have medication for a reason, but there comes a point in time where... Yeah, I write a lot of stuff on paper during the day when I'm working Yeah, um, to keep my thoughts right, <laughs> on paper. And... So yeah, so I don't distract myself and do something else. Yeah. So along this... I was asked, wondering how... Talking to your microphone. You got a microphone over there, man. It's your damn studio, you know. 
Come on, Jeff. I was just wondering how your faith has changed. You, you talk about your faith getting you through this, but has there been a change in your relationship to God? And what is what what does that mean for you? I mean, I've definitely gotten closer to religion. I started going to the mosque. I don't think I ever really attended the mosque. I've been to the mosque twice in my life. I don't. We don't have to go to the mosque in Islam. You can you know practice from home. Teachings from friends and family. Uh, but yeah, I've been trying to go to the mosque every Friday if I can. So, gotten a little closer. Um, I pray. So I've been to the mosque almost as many times as you've been to the mosque. <laughs> really? That's funny. Oh, you went during Ramadan, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, our religions are Christianity, Islam, Judaism. They're all very similar. Yeah. It's all one God. So. Is Hadi the guy that got you get to do Ramadan? No, it was his. No, with my, they're like cousins. They're friends, but we call each other cousins. We grew up together. Um, yeah. yeah, it's funny because I had mentioned, and, and it caught you off guard. And you, when we first met, I made a silly comment about Ramadan. About yeah, now that Ramadan's over, I'm going to do this. And you kind of looked at me like, bitch, don't <laughs> don't talk shit about our religion. Yeah. You didn't know. I had no idea that I did. I actually, I'm going to say it, I did Ramadan better than they did Ramadan. Oh, I'm sure. And I went the extra six days of Shalal, and and I like, I'm, if I'm going to do this, because I love those guys, I love you, and I respect it so much, and I'm like, man, I've thought about this for so long, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. And then community, they challenged me, like, Clark, if you're going to do this, you got to do it. Because I was going to go one day at a time. Just, hey, I'll, I'll try it out. Maybe I'll go a day or three. They're like, no, no, no. That's not how you do it. You're going to go. And I'm like, all right, let's go. It's good for you. It's actually, it's a healthy practice, you know? No, it's It's phenomenal. all discipline. It's yeah. Discipline is what most people lack. So, right. yeah, if you can discipline yourself to keep yourself from food for, I don't know, food sunrise to sunset, the hardest part, food man. and beverage from sunrise to sunset, then you 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 got the recipe for success in life. Well, you know? and then and then even more than that, like if we're talking, we're being honest about it, you know, lusting and, and doing all that sort of stuff. We held each other accountable yeah. for that time to not do what guys typically do. Like if a girl walks by and the clothes that they're wearing in the gyms now, it's hard not to look. Of course. You know, but we were elbowing each other and 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 you know, the code word that we were using is like go drink some water now, like you blew it. Oh, Just yeah. go drink water, go eat. And so anyway, back to what Jim was asking about. So your relationship with God has gotten stronger. So how do you how do you take that now and use that to be like the best husband? Like you're pitching a girl right now to uh, see you and, and like, you never know. You never know what could happen. We realize someone's on deck. There could be a possibility here. So we're not disrespecting her. This woman, like. Um, what do you want me to tell her? I hold the Quran and walk up to her and tell her, <laughs> I'll never cheat on you, my love. I'm allowed to have uh, right. three more wives. So we're allowed <laughs> four. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't think having faith in general means that you fear you have you have fear of a superior power a that reverence. you fear a superior yeah, power that yeah. there's somebody that you have to serve right yeah and, and, and when it's that's a healthy fear it's a reverence it's a healthy it's a, fear yeah it's so when that's said you're usually more accountable for your behavior than you would be without it ideally ideally that's the goal yeah it's like having a cop following you behind every you know corner that you're taking on the street you're not going to speed right so if you have this faith and it's strong enough, you will stray from doing anything that could be quote unquote wrong by religion. Yeah. So your moral compass becomes stronger than it already is. If there you, you have a strong one already. There you go. So we've identified, right, what could get your moral compass off. And, and it's no different than anyone else. It's, you know, funny that your name is Hottie because it could be a hottie that, you know, kind of. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> No more of those. Yeah, good that's on those. awesome. Brother, man, listen, this has been such a humbling conversation for me because, you know, that it was a beautiful day. I mean, the sun couldn't have been any more blue. The car couldn't have been any more expensive. The night couldn't have been any better. But that moment in time really kind of put you on a, 
Oh, it changed my life path. completely. Yeah. So with that being said, is there any final thoughts you have as we look at this car here and kind of Jim, pull that back up and show it on there again. And where, where are you at? The, you're already at the hospital. I'm already in the hospital time. at this point. Yeah. Damn, man. If that car doesn't tell you there is a God, then, you know, it's not, it is, it is, it's an utter miracle. I, I didn't expect to wake up from that. But you did, and you're here, and you just encouraged every person that listened to this thing, and I'm grateful that we're friends now, and, and here's what I do want to tell you. I know this wasn't comfortable for you. I know there was a lot of stuff that you were thinking that might not go your direction when you're really just being vulnerable because you just clearly displayed vulnerability. And that to me is, is badass, right? You, you know, you'd never done a podcast. You'd never really talked about this in, in an open forum like this, but you did it. Yeah. And I'm grateful for it because you just made what I do even more valuable <clears throat> to the people out there with your experience, man. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope this can benefit somebody in some way or another. I don't know if I've said anything important enough to benefit people, but um, you have absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a social media that you want anyone to come follow you on or anywhere you guys that people? Can. My Instagram, uh, don't judge the name. It's Lord Asposito, L O R D A S S P O S I T O. Okay. Um, yeah. Any I meaning had, behind that? You know, it's funny. I actually had a pizzeria for like seven years sports bar pizza place and um my buddy built my website at the time my degree is actually in computer science but so he built my website because i didn't have time to do it i'm too busy dealing with business um and at the bottom of it, it says all you know the restaurant created and whatever designed by h asposito I, I called him like who's asposito he's like that's your italian name bro so i changed my name across the internet to asposito just to kind of align up with that you know okay so that's where asposito comes from right on it was Don Asposito, um, but people started calling me Don, thinking that was my name. Oh. Instead of like Don, like... Right, like Don, yeah. right, yeah. The so, boss. So we changed it to Lord. Okay. Which is a little douchey, but I'm sorry. I'm not a douche, I promise. No, not anymore, at least. <laughs> a douchebag is... Uh, <laughs> he died on Del Dio's Highway. He died on Del Dio's Highway. Yeah, there you go. That That's the thing, man. He's been resurrected to a new man. And you're a blessing in my life, brother. I appreciate you very much. Likewise, thank you. All right. So that is it. As always, get busy living and make it a great day. Look at that, 60 minutes on the nose. How? Oh, that was an hour? Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs>